James chapter 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich. <clears throat> Weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. But above all, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The fervent, effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. And I'll, I'll stop right there. Um, plenty, of, plenty of places to go here this morning. But we're in the last chapter. And we're in the last of the series. And I, I really pray that this has blessed you. It is not, it's not an easy book. It can be very blunt. James can be very blunt. And it can cut you to the heart. But isn't that what the Bible is supposed to do? For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's cutting between your soul and spirit. Between joint and marrow. It exposes. It's supposed to expose our innermost thoughts and desires. And that is not ever going to be comfortable for any of us because those things that are innermost and our thoughts we want to keep that for us we don't want anybody else to know so let's get cut by the sword today with some last thoughts from James and I'll give you three thoughts and the first one is obviously regarding wealth because that's how James is starting out here and he's giving a strong warning to rich people But he was writing at a time where there were elite, rich, powerful people who were persecuting these Jewish believers who were scattered. And these elite were Sadducees and, and chief priests, mainly. And what was happening, they, they were living in these extravagant, luxurious houses, and they were getting fat off of the pilgrimages and the people's sacrifices of these you know, devout Jewish believers, they, they were uh, Jews. They were getting uh, fat off of their sacrifices. 
And really this parallels our day because in case you haven't checked or been aware of the fact, it is the elite who rule the world system. And unfortunately, there are modern day priests who use even Christianity to uh, become a six-figure superstar and they put on a great show for people to buy into. It's, it's, it's a little bit different, but not much different from back then. Back in James's day, these priests, they were doing all the festivals and the priestly duties. They were doing what was expected of them in their role for the purpose of maintaining power and their lifestyle and wealth. That's why they did it. And that's what James is rebuking. And he's doing it way harsher than I'm probably even speaking it this morning. It was hypocrisy. And these are supposed to be religious people. Now Jesus physically cleansed us out of the temple, right? Got really angry, kicked them out of there. And then what happened after that? They just got even more angry. And they're like, we have to eliminate this Jesus because he is ruining what we're trying to do. And basically we're trying to make a lot of money and maintain power and an image and, and all that stuff. Well, they killed Jesus, but they never eliminated him, right? Because he rose. But always remember, it was these elite, powerful people of power who had Jesus killed. Times weren't different much than they are now. There was economic oppression, which there still is today. There were tax collectors enslaving poor people into debt, into heavy burdens that they couldn't handle, taking advantage of their weakness. Now, rather than slavery to that kind of debt, Jesus came offering jubilee, uh, offering uh, freedom from the bondage to sin forever. And that's the ultimate victory. But today, it is the elite. It's classes of people, and they're living at the expense of the lowly. And you see it in other countries, obviously, but we also see it here. In fact, in our day, anyone who suggests just, oh, let's just forgive poor people their debts, they're going to be laughed at by the rich because debt is embedded into this. It's a slavery embedded into this world system. And it's to keep us dependent on the wealthy and the people of power that we may never become. I think, you know what I think of with this? I think of, it's a minor thing, monthly subscriptions, which have like, whew, past decade. When I grew up, there was not monthly digital subscriptions. There was no cell phones. So now you, I mean, you're paying, you pay a monthly fee. Let's take our music, right, for example. Spotify, Apple Music, Android Music, whatever you have. You're going to pay a monthly fee for all the music you listen to, and guess what? You're never going to own that music. It's never yours. You are enslaved to a subscription. Now, this is a small example, but ladies and gentlemen, it's mirroring exactly what this whole thing is about. It's keeping you enslaved. It's things that you'll never really own. It's a society of debtors to the rich and powerful. In that case, it would be tech companies. In this case, it was evil, wealthy tax collectors and things like that. But, ironically, remember when the great credit crisis hit in 2008? The rich people lined up to have their debts forgiven at the cost of the taxpayer. And several governments meekly did what was asked of them. So it's like one law for the rich, one for the poor, and this is just the way it is. And guess what? All, one day it's all going to be gone. So we don't have to fret about it. And James is condemning the, the elite for holding back, especially wages from the workers that they deserved, and the misuse of riches. And he's saying God is paying attention. Those wages that you're holding back from them, they're crying out to God just like... Uh, Abel's blood was crying out, right? God knows. Speaking about wealth, that's rich, evil, powerful men. Now speaking with believers, there's also with believers, there, first of all, there's nothing wrong with being rich. Amen? All you rich people say in your hearts, amen? Because you don't want anybody to know you're rich. Especially when the message is like this. 
Plus, you don't know when people are rich up here in Northwest Iowa anyway. So, um, you know, rich farmers, they don't walk around in, in fancy clothes, right? They're just farmers. So um, That's kind of cool, actually. There's nothing wrong with being rich as a believer, but there's something wrong with how you use your wealth if you misuse it. It's either going to be to glorify God or it's to glorify yourself. So we have to be careful with money, especially in our time. What's the word of our economy right now? Volatile. Everything's volatile. And now with the advent of digital currency where you can... Um, you can <laughs> money is traded for an image of a meme <laughs> based on what rich people decide and people are, I mean, it, it's insane. So one of the worst things you can do now in 2021, James would be preaching this too, is store up treasures for yourself, is to store up riches for yourself or to trust in riches now because God is going to turn everything upside down. He is going to do it. One day, all of this is going to rust and it's going to burn, and God is going to exalt the poor, and he's going to humble and bring the rich and powerful crashing down. So James is looking at this luxury. He's looking at houses full of food and uh, uh, cellars full of wine, and he saw all that as God sees them. Full of rust and moth-eaten, like what Je echoing what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Store your, for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth or, nor rust destroys and nobody's going to break in and steal because where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be also. I once again experienced this. I, I recently visited the Mall of America. Not my favorite place. And, and thank you to the family member who gave us a trip there, but she knows it too. It's not my favorite place. And with spiritual, with spiritualized, definitely it's not my favorite place. In fact, with spiritualized, with any discernment, it's a dark place, and it is wasting away. And my wife and I had many conversations. You walk around, and it's, it's everything's the pseudo- image of security and, and, and happiness and joy and all this. And we both, we had the strong impression, and I will say it, it was by the Spirit of God. And I remember Megan, she, she told me she kind of pictured it just, the Mall of America just wasted away and demolished, like kind of just a wasteland. And you see like the, the roller coaster in the middle just all rusted away, and it looks like one of those apocalyptic scenes desolate. One day it will be desolate, but ladies and gentlemen, it already is desolate because you cannot buy anything in that place that is going to bring you eternal happiness and it's all going to be gone one day. And we have to live with that mentality. I'm not saying don't enjoy your blessings. We all have many blessings and that doesn't mean you force on yourself this poverty mentality where you're going to purposely be poor and you're just going to, you know, you're going to humble yourself and just Give all your blessings away that God's given to you just to suffer for the gospel. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about not letting it rule you. Don't be enslaved into a culture of thinking of the culture is thinking more is better. More is better. Need an update. I need a new phone every year. Blah, 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 blah. Don't fall into that. Nothing out there is going to make you complete except Jesus Christ. And when the rust deteriorates and the moths eat away, um, all that's going to be left is what we've done for the kingdom of God. And that has to be our focus. And I speak at a, in a time of, would I say approaching economic crisis or are we in the middle of it? We're probably in the middle of it. Happens every whatever so many years, you know, they figured it out. There's going to be another economic crisis. I don't even have to prophesy that. I just, it's, it's logic. It's going to happen. Don't trust in your 401ks. That's hard to, no, don't, just don't. Don't trust in the stock market. Even the world is saying it's volatile. Don't trust in the government. It's not going to save you. They're all, they're all corrupted by sin, and they're going to fall. Jesus is the final word. And the real government, the Bible says, rests on his shoulders, right? 
he deci- and he decides when the, the, the next page turns, when the, when the next series of events are going to happen. So all we're called to do is not trust in riches, and then we're all called to this next one, which is, it's the second point, but it would be the main point. We have to have patience, patience. So James goes into this patience section of this chapter, and the book really begins and ends with a similar message. Endure through sufferings, and the circumstances you're going through, be patient through them, even persecution. Always in this book is in the context of persecution. Even when you face poverty, remember, some of these believers were facing poverty because of persecution. And James is encouraging them through that. Yes, some of them were rich also. That, nothing wrong with that. But a lot of them had everything stripped from them. So first, we have to have patience in our sufferings, in our trials. You have to have patience in your stresses in the workplace, in whatever financial hardships you may be going through, in your physical ailments, to everything else. Extreme tragedy that may or may not come in your life. At any given time, a a large percentage of the people in this church or watching, you're going through something. Some of you are going through something this morning. You're going through a crisis, you're in crisis, or you've just come out of crisis, or you're getting ready to go. I mean, it's, it's, it's happening. And we have to learn to wait, to really learn to wait on the Lord. And not just sing about it, do it. Now, James uses the example of the farmer. And in in a Northwest Iowa church, we surely have a few. I'd say there's a handful of them here in this room, right, who can relate to this. The farmer doesn't give up when their crop doesn't come right away, right? They don't just give up. They learn to live with the rhythm of the seasons. And really, farmers out of all people, know how to be dependent on God because they're literally depending on God for their livelihood. But we live in an American inpatient society where there's a demand to have every vegetable that's even out of season on the shelves all year round, and they'll even fly them in on planes to get them there just for our convenience. Convenience is king in this world. That's at a great cost to us. Because with every new form of, uh, every invented thing that makes our lives more convenient, guess what? For that equal amount of convenience, you have to have as a believer more discipline. You have to ingrain in yourself more discipline. You can download a movie in an HD movie in less than five minutes with most internet connections now. After 5G happens, it's going to be seconds. Pretty soon you're going to blink and the thing is yours at your everything, at your disposal. You can have pretty much everything, anything you want delivered to your door in two days. Wow. So all that makes us used to that and that gives us a hard, it's hard for us to develop patience now, and it spills over the impatience of society and culture and the world system. It's going to spill over now, boom, into our spiritual lives. It's here this morning. It's here, it's here right at this moment. I, I, I'll call it a spirit of impatience. Sure, why not? I'm not getting all super spiritual on you, but that's what it is. It's the impatience of the world system, and we put it on ourselves. If we don't have immediate relief, what happens? In trials, we may get into a panic. We may turn from God to other things in fear. And in fear is where we make the the most rash decisions. In panic, in that state of mind. Which in the end is actually pride because us being impatient is saying, "Well, well, our time is more important than yours, God. And we know, we think we know how time should work out more than you rather than trusting in your timetable. We are commanded in Scripture. James is commanding these believers, you have to be patient. You have to be patient. And the world is not helping you obey this command. 
because we want relief right away. We don't like pain. We don't like trials. We don't like tragedy. Nobody does. We want relief. Now we want it downloaded in seconds, just as fast as our connection. We want it direct deposited into our accounts. Relief. Rather than waiting on God and watching and praying and doing what the Bible tells us to do. In God's timing, not ours. And then when we don't get our way, what happens? We often act like we're grown adults acting like toddlers inside. And our father, he's just crying out, discipline. Not, not because I don't love you, it's because I love you. I want to develop this thing in you because this last day's message in here, it's serious. And we have to be ready for that. And if we don't have patience now, we're not just going to instantly develop it then. When stuff really, 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 really gets bad in, 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 in the world around you. You know, God's, yes, you're, ble- you're going to have his protection, you have his favor and all that. But the things around you, they are, they're going to get heavy. And you can't just bail out. You can't just have an escapist mentality and be like, I'm out of here. I can't. I can't handle this anymore. I give up, right? God's like, wait, child. Just wait on me. Grow and be patient. And be patient in yourself, how you deal with the circumstance, how you deal with the the trial or tragedy, whatever you're going through. And then here's the other thing James talks about. You have to be patient with other people in your life. You have to be patient in your relationships. And that's really important. These believers are in, that James is writing to, they're stressed out big time. They have people after them. They have people talking horrible things about them. They're literally being persecuted, of which we still we don't know yet. Still we don't know. We will one day, but not yet, this kind of persecution. So they're stressed out. And when a fellowship, when this, if we we're all a community of believers, when we're stressed out together, and we're under a threat, if we were under a threat right now, all that fear and all that anxiety that's coming into the community or the fellowship or the church, it's going to breed quarreling and conflict in the relationships in that fellowship, in the body of Christ. So James is trying to correct this. He sees the pressure that they're under, and he sees the reaction that's happening. And people are bashing and quarreling and basically killing each other because of the pressure that they're under because they weren't being patient like God commanded them to. We have to be patient with each other. It's a practice of humility. It's a practice of humility that Lord Jesus was patient going to the cross. Wow. He practiced it there. He exemplified it at Calvary. But we let the impatience of the world system now, we're going to let it not only impact how we react, but how we treat other people. When people, don't, when people don't see things your way, you ever get impatient with them? Yeah? This, is, this, is, this isn't just in the church. This is everywhere now. We write them off. Or we judge them in, their heart, in our hearts and we murder them in our hearts. Like a bunch of people stuck in traffic, and that's where people do crazy things. Now, here in Spencer, we don't really have traffic. What a blessing. Maybe in the lakes you guys have traffic, you know, when tourism season hits, but we don't have traffic. But when we do, people act crazy. And I get stuck. You ever get stuck in front of the train once in a while? There's only one train. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You ever see somebody do something crazy? Or maybe you're the one who does? They're just they're like, I'm not waiting anymore. I'm pulling off. <laughs> I'm pulling off and I'm going off in, into whatever. Maybe they'll drive on the sidewalk. I don't know. People do crazy things. They'll break laws or they'll shout angry words because how dare that train make them wait five minutes because they have to go to hy right now or wherever they're going. I grew up in New Jersey, very close, very close to New York City, and uh, it's constant beeping, 
and it's constant middle fingers and F words. So that's how, that's how patient people are up there. Obviously, you're in a place that's it's just it's going to be impatient. It's just an impatient place because everyone's in a hurry and their time is more important than everyone else's and it's this competition of time. But in our, in our dealings with our people, remember how patient God was with you. Remember, just remember, even if you got saved early on, rem remember the patience of the Lord in your life. How patient he was with me. Oh, man. I used to drive around on the streets of Florida and I would literally curse the God that I didn't know. I would blaspheme him. And I didn't even know who he was, but I just did it anyway because I had such satanic influence in my life. And God, the whole time, was just waiting, waiting, being patient with me, giving me mercy and grace. Even I didn't deserve that. I hated Christians. And I hated any idea of God. My life was horrible. And I was in a rush to die. And he was so patient with me. How patient was he with you? Why don't we treat other people that way? And so we have to ask him, Lord, help me apply the patience that you've shown me supernaturally to the handling of other people in my own life rather than running around trying to change people into your image of what you think somebody needs to be. Because we really... We have to make ourselves first, we're supposed to be Christ's image bearer. So it's not even about our image. Not so quick to argue and judge and turn your back on especially your brothers and sisters in the Lord. If there's one thing that, I, that troubles me the most in my season of ministry, however many years I've been in ministry, it's watching believers hurt other believers. And I think it's for a reason, because it's not supposed to happen. And the heart of God never wants that. He doesn't want that. He wants us encouraging one another and loving one another. We're worshiping together the same Lord Jesus. But today it's, you know, we live in uncertain times. Listen, we've lived in uncertain times since... since Jesus first came on the scene. And after his first coming, that really ushered in the last days. So we've been in uncertain times. And we can't let this world affect how we treat one another as believers. We cannot. People can't even be patient. Believers cannot be patient with how other believers handle COVID-19. I preached this 15 months ago, whenever this thing started, because the Lord showed me how much division it would cause in the body of Christ, and it hasn't stopped. And I can tell you guys over and over again, please don't. But, I, I mean, it's got to be you. It's got to be your change of heart, and you have to experience that for yourself where you look at someone, whether they've had a vaccine or not. What? We didn't care when each other had flu shots before. Why do you care now? I mean, I didn't used to, like, say, get out of here. You had a flu shot? I don't want you, you faithless fool. Or vice versa. I'd say, without raising hands, probably half of you have your vaccine, and most of you are afraid to tell anybody. Because somehow, you're afraid that's going to be you're going to be judged. What? Are we serious right now? What have we become? I, I, I asked that question. Come on. Happened with the masks early on. That's still going on. Of course, I'm confused now because I, I don't understand. I don't understand anything anymore. I've just, I give up. I understand Jesus, though. And I love him so much. And we have to, we have to get a hold of that patience that he has through all of this. So we can't even deal with that, let alone, let alone forgiving others of past hurts, which is really, really bad. Really, really bad. We hold on to things for way too long when we're supposed to be quick to forgive others. 
Silent animosity is the worst. It divides because it's not out there and it's inside and it's kept hidden and the Bible is meant to cut through that and reveal your innermost thoughts. And all from the pride, this all comes from the pride of impatience. Now God has taken me, I could do a whole testimony video for you guys. God has taken me to the woodshed to, of patience to deal with my impatience with other people. And he has, it is so awesome. I, I'm excited about it. It's hard for me to get the words out. I'm really sorry. But um, people who have cursed me out, like really cursed me out, called me horrible things. This is me as a believer now. Denounced me, ridiculed me, said horrible things about me behind my back. These were other believers. Like, why would that be happening? Because this is what James is dealing with. God taught me how to be patient with them in love. And anytime I've exercised that and asked for the Lord for help, and it's a hard prayer because he does, he takes you to the woodshed. It's not easy. But I won't tell you their names today, but some of those people who they cursed me out or they were, they, I dealt with these things, they're some of my closest friends now. How does that work? Patience supernatural grace, mercy, love, the Spirit of God operating in your relationships. So imagine if I had given up on those people. Imagine if God was impatient with you. That would stink, right? I'm done with you. I give up. Our timetable is not God's, and we are arrogant to think otherwise. We have to focus on His timing. We have to, Colossians 3.2, set our minds on things above. It's very simple, not on things of the earth. So, wait for that train to pass without getting upset. Don't get mad. Whether that train is a trial or it's an annoying person, an annoying person in your life, right? God has sent that annoying person in your life to teach you patience. And don't you dare run from it. How are you going to learn if everyone's just, you love everybody and because they're never getting on your nerves and they're easy to get along with? That's not how you learn. That's not how you grow, right? You business leaders in here, you probably already know that. Managers at a job, you know that. Employers, of course. Wait for that intersection in your life to clear up. Remember, James was writing also in the context of the climate. And here's some more farmer stuff for you. It's the climate of Israel which receives its early rain in late October and early November and then the, the later rain in April or May. So that's a long time to wait. So the farmer has to wait patiently knowing he can't rush the process. There's nothing he can do about it. Circumstances now in your life, they're going to take time to pass. Relationships take time to heal and grow, but you have to have patience. It's not Amazon Prime Christianity where you just get it. And it's at your door and you complain when it's not at your door. You can't pay for a second day delivery for relief in whatever trial you're going through this morning. But you can wait on the Lord and here's the cool part, you're always guaranteed results. The results are that you're going to have strength in Him. The Bible says, for sure, those who wait on the Lord, they're going to renew their strength. I would say that if you don't wait on God now, in these times, you're going to destroy your strength and you're going to become weak in the Lord. And somebody's going to have to pick you up and say, what are you doing right now? Why are you giving up? And, and it's a humbling place to be, but it's your choice whether you go there or not. God is always going to come through with the rain. Jesus is coming again. This is also a last day's message that James is preaching. And we are still in the last days. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. The world is stressed out. This should be the least stressful place for you this, this week in the presence of the Lord. And on top of that, you should be able to find this least stressful place when you yourself are in the presence of the Lord during the week if you are pursuing a relationship with him and communicating with him. So the world is stressed out, but the world is dying. The kingdom of God is not stressed out. The kingdom of God 
is at peace because it knows. And we should know, well, Jesus is coming soon. What are we stressing about? He's going to return. And this is going to end. Everything's going to end. Political division, COVID rules, financial hardship, death, sickness, pain. And for perspective, James has given these, this Old Testament prophet analogy. And he's like, listen, these guys, they were laughed at. They had their backs cut open with whips. They were chained in dungeons. Anybody been chained in a dungeon recently? Some died by stoning. They died by being stoned to death and sawed in two. I'm sorry, kids, but this is what the word says. Wow. Hebrews 11, 36. Some went about in skins of sheep and goats, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in dens and caves. They were hungry and sick and ill-treated, too good for this world. It's like, look, if they can be patient through that, you guys have to have patience with each other and stop grumbling and tearing each other apart. And then blessing came. And then he brings up Job too. Of course we know Job. He talk about patience. Goodness gracious. Well, what ties all this together? What ties this together? Well, easy, simple. I just said it. Communicating with God. Prayer ties it all together. Prayer ties it all together. People of prayer depend on God and not their bank accounts. From the first point. People of prayer, they trust in God's timing and not their own. Because they are communing with God. And Prayerlessness is the greatest pandemic of our generation. Prayerlessness is the greatest pandemic in our day in believers, and its symptoms are they have overtaken and they've manifested. They've manifested in your relationship problems. They've manifested in our lifestyles. They've manifested every way. The result of prayerlessness has come to pass. And it's a tragedy. And there's a cure, thank God. Spiritual apathy, a life of unbelief, and even apostasy. All relationships deteriorate deteriorate without genuine open communication. This is why we have friendships. This is why we have marriages. God is teaching us how to have a real relationship with Him. And He is God. He's the God of the universe. And these are just examples of it. If, if, you're not, if you are not 100% open and transparent with your, your spouse and in that kind of relationship, you keep hitting secrets, you're doing stuff, blah, 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 blah it's going to fall apart, right? Or there's no communication. You know, you talk to each other, I don't know, once a week or something. You know what's going on in each other's lives because you're so busy. That's dangerous too. You, you have to have constant communication. You have to have a relationship. And the bride of Christ, they're suffering now from refusing to really communicate with its groom, Jesus Christ. And the results are more devastating than any world crisis can give us because it's affecting our our spiritual standing in, in Jesus. So James says, okay, is anybody suffering? Then he must pray. He has to pray. Are you cheerful? Okay. Sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they're supposed to pray over them, anointing them with oil. And he goes on. So when things gets, ba- gets really bad in our lives, James tells us simply to pray. When things are good in our lives, we're supposed to be praising God. The point is, is that we are going to, we have to develop a reaction in crisis to be naturally dependent on God no matter what happens. We have to be dependent on God in all circumstances. And this isn't grudgingly forcing yourself to pray because, okay, well, I better pray now. And, okay, Lord, please help me. Um, we got to get, you know, this is real. We're talking about real, real uh, prayer from a genuine relationship in suffering and then in sickness, of course, because sickness, that's, that's a hard time for us. And then, James goes on to say, side note, he says, call for the elders and the anointing of the oil, and scholars go back and forth with this. 
because they're like, well, what was that oil for? Was it for medicine or was it for, you know, sacramentally symbolizing the Holy Spirit? So I've studied this way too much. And I, I looked at the original Greek. The anointing of the oil part in the original Greek, it actually comes before the prayer. And that anointing oil was actually used for medicinal purposes. But that, all that simply means is this. You can take medicine and still pray. You know what I'm saying? Now, they used olive oil back then for everything. I'd say we just need to douse ourselves in olive oil right now. That'll take care of a lot. <laughs> we don't trust in olive oil that much. I was born in olive oil, by the way. My mother, Italian. My father, Greek. So I was actually in olive oil in the womb. Most people were. I guess nobody got that except my wife, maybe, so... But they used olive oil, guys. They used it for the medicine. It was, you know, it, was a, it had healing properties, things like this. So that's what it means. And that means you can take medicine and God works through doctors, of course. Ultimately, though, we seal it with faith-filled prayer, always. Trusting the results to God. And, of course, the oil, the anointing oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit. So we, I take that both and for both of that. But the, the oil is not something you buy online and it's going to, you know, magically just eradicate demons from your household or guarantee your healing. We have to understand that God heals. He's the healer. He decides when we are commanded to believe and we have to believe in the entirety of our faith that he's going to heal. And you don't have to be perfect to pray a powerful prayer either. And James, he says, look at Elijah. Elijah was human like us. What did he do? He just prayed earnestly and with sincere conviction. That's all that matters. You just have to be real. And breakthroughs aren't happening in, in our lives often because we just aren't praying in faith. And James is saying the fervent or effective prayer of a righteous man, it can accomplish a lot. So prayer is not effective because it's not really fervent. Fervent doesn't mean long. Fervent doesn't mean fancy or loud or what you learned at your prayer conference of the right words to say or you got on your little card that says, I have a card somewhere in my office that I don't use. It says, how to pray to, how to pray effective healing prayers or cast out demons or something like that. I don't use the thing. I just pray. I just pray and believe God for the rest. So it just means being real. We can't pray with this lukewarm attitude like we're asking God to care about something that we don't care about. We have to care about what God cares about. God sees our hearts and if our prayers are really fervent or not. So we have to be affectionate in our prayers. And if you're affectionate with God, then you're going to be affectionate in your prayers because you're going to care about what he cares about. And that's seeing other people saved. That's seeing people healed and delivered from not just sickness, but depression and uh, seeing people set free. And then James talks about like correcting uh, backslidden believers, right? Because there are people who are falling into sin and it is our place as believers to correct them. But hold on, hold on. Before you get all, I'm going to go correct everybody. It was out of, it was out of a, a loving thing, you know? And it wasn't, it wasn't in regards to vaccines and face masks. We're talking about like, your brother in Christ is cheating on his wife and you're going to go uh, you're going to go help him out of this pit that he's in we're talking about sin that's what James is talking about God desires his bride to be functioning and at peace and uh, not bickering with each other praying for one another all of us praying for one another not just saying, I'll pray for you. And then a week later, you haven't prayed for them. I'm calling it out in myself first and then in you. We have to really pray. We have to really have our yeses be yeses and our noes be noes. We have to be people of integrity. God desires we wait his coming with patience grounded in the awareness of his imminent return. That he's coming soon and we have to be ready. And God desires that we never trust in earthly things, earthly things that were wrought away over his eternal spirit. So this is a message, this is it, that James wrote 
to a troubled and divided church in a chaotic time with economic oppression and last day's events already happening. And here we are now. I don't know exactly how long later, but it hasn't changed much. But the intensity has changed because it should be more. The fervency should be more. And out of all times now, 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 yeah, now you should come up. Out of all the times now, Corga needs to come up. And I'll tell you why. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you why, guys. And we're getting ready to pray real quick before we leave here. Unless you are impatient. Um, music, it is a powerful tool. It does something to us. It is God's design and his creation. Remember... Um, David, he would play the harp every day, right? He used that as a powerful, had the power to do some intense things with Saul and, and, and the prophets and all that stuff. You read those stories. So music is powerful. So that's why this isn't just to make you, you know, feel cool. Um, Corgan's up there just inviting once again the spirit and maybe to hopefully soften your hearts because I'm about to ask you to do something uncomfortable. Oh, no, run away. No, we're going we're to take a few moments and pray today. The first thing is, if you're suffering, if you're suffering, if you're sick, you know what? Let's close our eyes. Let's close our eyes. Come on. Come on. You are sick, suffering, in pain, any of those things this morning. If that's you today, raise your hand right now. You need prayers right now. Come on. No, raise them high. Come on. Mental pain, physical pain, whatever it is. Okay, keep them up. Keep them up. I know it's uncomfortable. We got to do this. We got to do this. We're going to obey scripture. Everybody open your eyes. Look around. Somebody with their hand raised, you're a believer. You're going to go up to them and pray for them. And you're going to pray with fervency and the conviction that God is going to do something in this place today. And I just read it. It says that our prayers accomplish much. And it even says that that prayer will heal people. So we have to believe that today. So in the next, as soon as I release you, find those, those people and go and pray over them. You don't have to be fancy. You don't have to be super spiritual. You don't even have to be trained. You just have to know who Jesus is and know that he can do it. That's the requirement for praying for other people. And in the New Testament, it's never just the one man of the hour, the preacher, who is the only one laying hands on a line of people because he has some big anointing. It was the elders. It was like a community of people. It was together. We prayed for people. And we saw miracles. See, not one person shares in that glory. Isn't that awesome? So that's the first thing. The next thing is, this is really important. If you're in this place today and you have had a problem or an impatience or a judging or a, I don't know, something happened with you and somebody specifically in this room, oh, this is hard. I want you to go and, not me, God wants you to go and pray with that person. Whatever it takes, make amends with that person. Whatever it takes, even if it's the smallest thing, like you judge them because you, they saw, you saw them with a face mask and hive or something. All right? The smallest thing. We have to do this because our time is limited. So if there's anything we should be in a hurry with, it's praying for people and making amends with brothers and sisters in Christ. And then everyone else, you can just pray for whoever you want to pray for. So I'm going to release you now to pray right now.